say it. Welcome to another episode of Dear Dietitian, <clears throat> featuring myself and Tyson. <laughs> what an intro. <laughs> so much enthusiasm. Yeah. You could feel it through the screen, I'm sure. It's cold here today, look, see, wearing jumpers and jackets. Yep, Sunshine Coast cold, so it's like probably like 17 degrees. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Let's see what it is. So a quick, that's 19. It's just it's raining. 19 degrees. <laughs> It's actually in the lullaby, we don't really actually in the lullaby. We're not sure what it says. Oh. See? <laughs> Look at our weather forecast, it's going to be chilly. Okay. Oh. 10 and 11 degree mornings. <laughs> not those Melbourne crews, but. Um, all right, so first question. Someone on Snapchat hit us up. So do you think recommending replacing one meal a day with an OptiFast product and ensuring that the other two meals meet the OptiFast guidelines would work to help clients with a moderate amount of weight loss. To start with, it's like, what is moderate? Yes, and it's a weird question because it's just like, well, why wouldn't they? <laughs> it depends yes. what their diet looks like at the beginning, but. So is this for a moderate amount of weight loss or is it that they've had a moderate amount? Are yeah. they, were they 150 kilos and now they're 130? No, I think it's just asking, um, will they lose weight in, a, in a equivocal amounts to what you would if you were on a multi fast complete meal replacement plan? No. <laughs> Why? Why? Because you're likely going to have a greater calorie deficit with three multi fast than two meals in multi fast, or at least you can portion it out and you know exactly what the intake is if they're just having three shakes a day. But what about if they measured the amount of meat and made sure there was like it was lean and it was exactly say what 800 kilojoules as to what the OptiFast is? No more than that. It's a, it's a small amount of food that you can sit on that plate. <laughs> and then it was legit just lettuce. <clears throat> sure. <laughs> they might lose weight. I guess what Tyson's suggesting is that we know people and people generally uh, struggle with portion control and generally don't have that same consistency and that's what uh, OptiFast and the other meal replacement program does is provide you consistent amounts of food and there's your energy. Um, the other is that potentially the OptiFast might be more filling for some um, compared to like this much meat and Yeah salad. and it's just a mind thing as well like yeah. if this is the first time you're going back onto the food after maybe doing OptiFast three times a day and you remember what your plate look, used to look like and they still got their big plates so they used to serve it up on but now they're serving a small portion of their plate it's not gonna not gonna work even for the most diligent person in the world it's still an, an um, area of unknown because you don't know how lean that piece of steak is really and the nutritional composition of a steak or chicken or fish or whatever else they're using is still going to be variable because it is whereas OptiFast is OptiFast. And the other is the impact of bowels. So um, poo is heavy. Um, when you're on a complete meal replacement, you don't really create a lot of stool bulk. Um, so potentially the weight loss, particularly early phase, would be significant. Whereas you're still eating food, you're still creating fecal mass, significant amounts of it when you're eating two meals a day. Um, and I don't know, just different patterns and different ways of eating, depending on what that person's diet generally looks like, you're going to get greater weight, um, greater weight loss using meal replacements. And really, I would be saying, as a client, I'd be thinking, well, what's the point? Like, why wouldn't you just replace the entire meals? And particularly, I would use the OptiFast to replace a meal that's mostly energy dense. So I would never use it for a breakfast meal. That's ridiculous. You can equally create a meal around the 800 kilojoule mark. So I'd use it either for an evening meal or for um, a lunch, but even still, like really, you're going to get the biggest benefit from a nighttime meal. Yeah. And what I've always found anyway, if people are on this type of thing, if you're saying doing two OptiFast and one not, a lot of people just go, all right, do breakfast and lunch off your fast and then have dinner and not, which is stupid because you're getting hungry by the end of the day. Mm. So if you're doing it that way, they're just going to backload all their calories at the top. Like whether or not they're trying really hard or they're following your instructions, it's still going to be a lot harder for them. Mm. Versus if you start and you just have the, um, a normal breakfast and then you have the things like, I think it's just better. Mm. Yeah, it's and we've, we've seen in practice, our practitioners have definitely used OptiFast. I have. 
Um, and even still with that, there's variable amounts of moderate weight loss with the clients that completely replace their diet with um, a meal replacement. Um, last week I had a couple, one lost 10 kilos in two weeks, another one lost two. So go figure. Yeah, I mean, you're never going to get the consistent downward trend that you'd hope. But obviously that's based on what that person's diet looks like at the beginning and also then what their starting weight was. One quick thing with healthy pass though, like some dietitian use it as a kind of crutch they just just go all right you're overweight have off your fast they use it as like an easy kind of way that they believe they don't have to think about anything they don't have to i don't know i think a lot of dietitians are scared to use a meal replacement some are or they don't think that it's good because you know we're all about eating food and teaching behaviors yeah. and yeah but then i guess it's only because we've come up against one that wasn't part of our organization that we know just pretty much prescribed healthy fast to every single person. Uh, that pissed me off. It's just like it's just lazy dietetics. So there's no real behaviour change there. Like with healthy fast, they're not going to do that forever. So you still at some point need to be a dietitian and create some behaviour change. So I, I think it can certainly be useful, but definitely don't use it with every single person um, or use it as a your first line of defence. Um, I've Definitely. never used it as my first line of defense. No, neither. I'm not saying. Have you used it just with someone in general? Yeah. Apart from bariatrics? Yep. Yeah. Um, well, she had, a learning, she had a learning disability and she really liked them before she came in. She's like, I really want to have these. Yeah, and that's like, okay. where I've used it as well as people have either they're currently using a replacement uh, or they have previously lost weight and been quite successful on it. Um, yeah, yeah and a lot of people have got that. It's like, oh, it worked last time, so I want to do that again. Mm -hmm. like, okay, well, you can do that. What but... would be your thoughts around replacing, instead of a meal replacement, that's, you know, got vitamins and minerals and shit in it, um, that someone just used a whey protein, just pure whey protein, same amount of energy. <laughs> and just said, Or three times a day. Yeah, yeah, because I've had that question as well. Uh, can I just uh, use a protein supplement? Well, it's not a meal replacement. No. And it's not a nutritionally complete meal replacement. I guess that's the thing about using OptiFast or an OptiSlim um, for their nutritionally complete versus just random ones off the shelf or at the pharmacy that they're hawking. Like, but they're oh. obviously only nutritionally complete when you um, recommend them appropriately. So, for example, yes, three. yeah, 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 versus yeah, three, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. versus only having one and having a meal replacement or having whey protein. Mm. Like a lot of people would think that three is appropriate, but you know, when you've got your 150 kilogram man, it's probably not going to be appropriate. Yeah, you have four. Hmm. Thoughts? No. <laughs> I'd probably go more than that. That's not going to meet his requirements for protein. Well, it depends on, yeah, well, you might add an additional in, but you're not going to go and have five of them. No, you'd probably just add a protein yeah. powder. Yeah. Mm, which is what I've previously done as well. I don't know if there was a question that you had in there, you just started talking. Oh, no, no, I'm just saying that that's not always a standard either, is the three meals a day. Oh, no, for some. no, 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 yeah. and you can change it up, and I know there's the soups and the bars, I don't particularly use them much. May as well just go get a glorified Bonox, really, and just use that. But I get glorified what? Bonox. Bonox. Yeah, like chicken noodle soup, Bonox oh. the noodles. Um, but obviously it doesn't have the add-ons, you know, there's no protein in that. Yeah. Yeah, I haven't tried the Optifast. I've tried them. Then what do they taste like? Soup. Mm. It's fine. The bars are alright. That was pretty tasty. I think there was a chocolate raspberry one. I don't know. You like Berries. It? Berry one. I don't know. It was alright. Mm. Just gotta try this stuff. Dietitians. Yeah. Get on no, it. You've been Go doing load it up. a lot lately. <laughs> and then you can uh, inform your clients that you've tried the different things and different tastes and textures they're pretty solid if you put them in the fridge they're like rocks <laughs> that's like most protein so tries, though. yeah yeah i tried it room temp and fridge you know don't do a fridge or or you do it in the fridge because then it takes you ages to eat it so it's actually like a normal meal so that's the other thing like the OptiFast where I tell them to add a heap of ice and then do you blend it up. Knives and forks to chop it up and eat it? No, like <laughs> George from Seinfeld. No, uh, <laughs> but you just nibble on it. I get the slight, yeah. Um, but yeah, with OptiFast as well. Like, <clears throat> have we talked about already? Like putting the ice in and like making a blended thing so then it 
and sucking out of a straw so it takes longer to actually eat. Mm. You can try that, do that, it takes longer because when I did the Opti fast and then you're just drinking it, you don't feel like anything because you finished it in 30 the seconds. The other is blending it and making it into a smoothie bowl and eating it with a spoon. Okay. Mm, and putting like some berries and stuff or some passion fruit and things. I think that they can obviously crunch and eat as well. They mm. just change up. Well, that's why the ice comes in handy too. Yeah, I know, but then it's just really watery. Mm. There's always ways to make things more palatable long term. And just more from the physiological, yeah, wanting to chew something. Mm or wanting to take longer with it. So if it takes 10 minutes versus the 10 seconds that I would just to drink the shake. Mm. Anyway, Good. next question. We went down rabbit holes as usual. <clears throat> All right. May, hello. <laughs> May I know if function, functional nutrition is what a dietitian practices? If not, how is it different from it? This is on Snapchat again. Remember, you can hit us up on Snapchat, Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, yeah. wherever you want. <laughs> um, so yeah, is right. that the same as functional medicine and integrated medicine? I'm, I'm thinking this is what they mean. So we'll go with that tact first, and then we can talk about what we deem as functional nutrition. Because mm. there's nutrition that you implement to make their bodies more functional. I would say, literal. yeah, I would say that's probably related to supplements and... It's probably not for us. Um, Integrative medicine. Yeah. 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 I would say, no, it's not what we practice most of the time. There's a number of medical practitioners here on the coast that do integrative medicine and functional medicine. And my understanding is actually some cred about that, but they're GPs, they're doctors, so... And they're yeah, it depends on how, it's how long a string it is, though. Like, yeah. There might be some, but then if they're wildly saying for everyone. But basically, no, that's not generally what we're taught or practiced. I remember doing one, one subject, one lecture on, yeah, like the different, I think there might have been an assignment on it, like doing like St. John's Wort and all those kind of. Yeah, so currently I am reading the heaviest book known to man. Rosanna tries to pick it up and I swear it would kill her if it fell Rosanna, on her. Rosanna, her child. Yeah, um, on the um, evidence-based medicine of natural um, yeah, natural supplements and therapies. And it's a very interesting read. It's extremely extensive and it's opening my eyes up a lot. Um, mm. Can't say I would start supplementing. However, it gives me a lot more credit to be able to debate and um, debunk a lot of myths that people will have when they're coming in around supplements. Um, so, yeah, and look, people like to take things. I understand that. Last week I took about three or four supplements off a client with salicylate intolerance because it smelled like it was so strong, these supplements, and they were coloured, and a nutritionist, who I'm sure probably was a functional nutritionist, gave her these after they did vega testing and... Um, blood testing. What's vega testing? Um, you know, like some sort of electrodes that they stick on the people and that feeds back to them and tells them they can't eat kiwi or oh, okay, of peach. Of course. So. Yeah. So it's about their aura, or is it just? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's some sort of feedback. Um, and the same with like a sticky blood. Like they take the blood and they look for this like, cells, and apparently she's got like, like sticky liver disease or something. Oh, okay, of course. Okay. So she's got poor digestion of fats because it's extra sticky. Mm. Yeah, so I'm sure that there are all sorts of things. And like I said, you know, she ended up with a batch of supplements that she brought to me. And you How know, much did you pay for them to just take? Oh, no. It would have been good. It would have been like 350 But as you know, someone with a salicylate intolerance, because she's got asthma and all the above, and she's been told, she went to Anne Swain at the allergy clinic in Sydney, and um, at that stage she couldn't handle implementing the diet, but now she's ready. Um, so she came to me to change those things. Why did she go to the other person first? Who knows? I don't understand it because they still come back to us and then her symptoms got worse because she started having green smoothies because she oh. couldn't eat kiwi anymore but she didn't have as many greens. I'm like, that makes sense from a salicylate point, doesn't it? She goes, yeah, I didn't think it made much sense but I thought I'd try it. Um, and then these pungent smelling potent chemicals which obviously are rich with floral, floral salicylate flavour um, and smell 
would have just done her aspirin, but she can't smell or taste, so she probably didn't really feel can't like smell it. or taste. No, she's like totally blocked up. Same. Mm. Okay. Yeah, anyway, but that's the thing, like we deal with the end of it here when people have gone through. So in terms of functional medicine. Help. No, thank you. <laughs> All right, next question. Mm. So this is a, again on Snapchat. So it's a Snapchat episode today. Uh, hey guys, student dietitian wanting to know if I'm right in saying, and it's a picture, I'll, I'll show it to the camera in a second, right in saying that these have a great amount of fiber, spell fiber wrong, and a high in good fats and protein, however they are carbohydrate, <laughs> sodium and energy per 100 grams lets them down a lot, Should especially you the, the sodium. Yeah, I'm gonna show. Mm. And they're wanting to get better at label reading. So I'm gonna hold this up and I think that's gives yeah, you yeah, an exactly. idea. So you can pause that and look at it if you want. Podcast people, you probably can't see it, but jump onto YouTube, check it out. All right. So basically the energy is 500, uh, uh, should we go per 100 grams? Yeah. Per 100 grams, it's 1900 kilojoules. We didn't get told what this product was, but we Peter's guess what it is. Lentil chips. Lentil chips for thinking. Chips. <laughs> yeah. So energy, 1900 kilojoules per 100 grams. Protein, 17.7 grams per 100 grams. Fat total, 20 or 21. And then the monounsaturated is 16.7 of that. And then carbohydrates is 50 grams per 100. Fiber is 7.4 per 100. And sodium is 575. And of those carbohydrates, only two grams of sugar. That's why I think it's a gram a chip. Yeah. So mm. lentil chip. Mm, given the fiber content. Yeah. So flour mix is the number one ingredient. And then, mm. yeah. It's got bean, lentils and beans. 55% and... bean. Then chickpeas, sour sorghum, chickpea potato starch. Mm. And high... High oleic acid, which is yeah. probably going to be the, um, the fat content. Fat. Yeah. yeah. So what is the original question? The original Just question is, yeah, so am I right in saying these are a fiber. good amount of fiber and no. high in good fats and protein? No, as a per serving, which you would use for things like cereals and stuff, it's not. It needs to be at least over three. Look, it's high protein for a chip, five grams per serve. Mm. But in this package of the lentil chip pack, it's five serves per pack. Oh, of course. So mm -hmm. five by 500 kilojoules. So 2,500 kilojoules per bag. That's a lot of energy. That's pretty solid. And you get 20 grams of protein out of that bag, but that's a lot of energy for the amount of protein. It's like the U Foods um, protein donut that I posted on Instagram, check it out. Because um, <laughs> adding protein to a donut, which inherently is still a donut, doesn't make it better. And the same with fiber, just because the product's got fiber in it. It's still a chip. It's still a chip. <laughs> it's, it's not something you want to be eating flowers. every day. It's still a refined product. Yeah. But in terms of skill-wise and label reading, um, so how would you how would you nut it down if you were talking to a client about that? Would you just say exactly what you said to us, or I'd say it's still a chip. It's too much fat. Mm -hmm. I don't care if it's good fat or not. It's too much fat in it for what it is. Like the sodium, it's not too bad to be honest for a chip. Mm. Do you agree? Yeah, it's pretty good. Yeah, you know, really? For a cracker, it's... Um, and, you know, fiber, whatever. If you're going to choose a chip, maybe it's a good chip to choose, mm -hmm. but it's still a chip. So I'd be like, yeah, no, nah, don't, don't really do that. So the way I would, yeah, the way I would work through that education is, say, for example, you're working with a client, their goal is weight loss, of course, um, and you're vetting your advice around that. So, yes, when we're looking at snacks, um, obviously, around the 500 kilojoule mark for a snack is probably not too bad for someone who's trying to lose weight, depending on their actual um, total diet. Yeah, but it's five but size per package. The serving size is only 30, 30 grams. grams. So it'd be like. Yeah. So what I would do with that client is show them what 30 grams is. Yep. And then I'd probably compare the weight of food to other alternatives. So in terms of reading food labels. And how I would educate a client is um, focusing on their nutrition goals. That's the absolute. Then you would focus in on whether this is a meal, um, this is going to be a snack, and what particular nutrients you want to focus on. Because if it's going to be a snack, really, I just look at the energy content. You could you could then use that label to discuss protein, discuss fiber, discuss salt. If 
but um, it's important to just literally identify a couple of things on a label for someone um, because if you talk through all of that, we would understand that they would just go mm -hmm. glassy eyed. Yeah, ultimately at the end of the day, they just want your assessment. So our assessment mm -hmm. is pretty short in terms, it's still cheap, so don't mm -hmm. have it all the time. Yeah, like it's still a donut, just because you put protein in it doesn't make it better. Yeah. Um, so yeah, hone into the Just because it's dark chocolate doesn't mean you have to have a block. <laughs> what? I've got a mate that's like, <laughs> like it's just like, oh, oh, it's it's uh seventy percent cocoa, so like I can have more because it's good for you. It's like you're a freaking idiot. No. So anyway, that was just my personal little addition to that. But yeah, you mm -hmm. answer the question. Mm -hmm. Cool. I've got one. All right. Um, this wasn't from Snapchat or Instagram. This is from a dietitian. Um, yeah, but these people could be dietitians. Yeah, I know, but this was not from a social media platform, so I was trying to All right. come at. Go. So um, they emailed us. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Go. Okay. Um, so it's around. Um, so hypertension. Um, if you've got a client just with high blood pressure, hypertension, but it's well controlled, um, they're not carrying a lot of weight. What would be the diet? plan that you would prescribe for them. They got hypertension and they're not overweight. Mm. Love the salt. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Is that one of those moments? It's like, should I eat meat? <laughs> All over again. Love the salt. You can go dash diet if you're gonna go super hard, but I don't know that many people that follow that well. Mm -hmm. Do you recommend dash diet? Even though it's the gold standard mm. or whatever for it, like Realistically, not many people are going to be able to do it. Yeah, because obviously, if you have someone who's on medication, they're controlled for blood pressure. I've had many instances where you've been able to get the blood pressure medication off the client because you've lowered the salt. Yeah. Yeah, improved the quality of the diet, all of the above. So, yeah, that's pretty much it. Dash is D A S F S H. And so for you all, um, hopefully this could be a little link on the bottom, it probably will be, but there's a really good website, it's called findlowsaltfood.info, um, Google it, find low salt food. It's really good, it's got pictures and it's up to date of products from A to Z, and if you hover over the picture, it has um, comes up with the amount of sodium per 100 gram, it's really good. Uh, and it's a good one to direct your clients to as well too, so follow that link, um, cool. Um, the other one was around um, malnutrition. So, um, being referred a client for malnutrition, um, what would be your recommended um, malnutrition screening tool that you would use? Oh, okay. <laughs> um, why in the community? Yeah. Well, there's none that are actually evidence based in the community. Um, all of the malnutrition, well, to my knowledge, I don't think there's one currently that is used, that has been, um, what is, what is it called? Validated. Mm -hmm. I was going to say qualified, so yeah, validated is the word. Did you use but, them in the hospital? Yeah, yeah. So in the hospital, I, I use the PGSGA every time. Like, people can use the malnutrition screening tool. What like, about the Nestle MST, one? The MNT, like MET. I don't really like them, they're too simple. Mm. Um, like, there's the one that the nurses use, which is the malnutrition screening tool, um, which is like two questions. It's like, is your appetite? How's your appetite? <laughs> and then have you I've lost weight? Nutrition. <laughs> have you lost weight in, in the last six months unintentionally? <laughs> um, and then how much? But PGSGA across the board, I just like it. It's the most robust in my opinion. It's got the most factors. You're ticking off all the nutrition impact symptoms as well as antro changes, um, fat and muscle mass wastage. And then you've got a classification. And in a hospital, I know they get ranked higher if you you got the right classification and the right number, so the hospital will get more funding. So doing that in the hospital, most of them will drill that into you. They didn't mind because they didn't know about it until I told them. But um, yeah, in terms of in community, you can still use PGSGA. Um, but at the end of the day, there's nothing that's necessarily yeah, validated. So it comes down to what you want to mm. use and what's suitable. But you yeah, have PGSGA, the patient doesn't actually have to tell you this. So is much. there value in doing it? So for example, if you know someone's malnourished, you can them, like, is there a value in actually say, doing it? Say, like, when you get some experience, you, you know when someone's malnourished, like the moment you see them, you can see them walking down the street sometimes. 
if you just walk into a nursing home, um, you'll see a bunch. But um, is there value if you need that clinical justification for yourself to say it? I think there is. If you're reporting back to someone who may have a greater interest in knowing that classification, I think it adds weight to the argument and saying that it's not your personal opinion. It is something that was validated, even though it's not community validated, if you've used a scale that has been validated elsewhere. Um, and so in relation to where they fit, depending on that score, would your recommendations be different? Yes, because if they're just an SGA, so SGAA, um, then that's the low end, so they're not that malnourished and they might be just at risk, um, then there might be less recommendations around that. It's hard to say without an individual in front of you, but then B and C, obviously much more intensive. If it went to C, I'd be absolutely smashing them full of food. I think it would be very rare for you to see a C in the community. It's more likely a hospital setting because when they get to that point, you're not going to see a lot of C's that are outside of hospital. Um, in my opinion, they're pretty much on their way out unless they get some serious food into them. And a lot of them end up on nasogastric antral feeding just to boost them for a bit. And with those um, little eater bitties that are safe, you know, 35, 40 kilos, and obviously they've dropped um, a lot of weight. Well, 35, 40 kilos, you're going to be getting close to a C. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So would your strategy just be get the protein in or would you focus on some carbohydrates and as well? Fact, yeah, I've told oldies in the community to go Because the traditional malnourished diet is high protein, high energy. Yeah, so mm. high energy involves fat. Mm. So if they want to go get Maccas, go get Maccas. If you like fish and chips, have four days a week. What about the satiety of that food compared to simple, straightforward biscuits, which are just easy to consume or... Yeah, but crackers. you can't eat enough biscuits. Yeah. Unless they're going to make like lattice biscuits, which is like just like a cheesecake inside some fatty, fatty biscuits, then yeah, sure, do that. But a lot of the time they enjoy having ice cream and things of that nature. So choosing going the other end of the spectrum and not getting the low fat one, get the full one, change all, everything to full fat. Like just make it as nutritionally dense as possible. And again, it depends on the person. If the itty bitty old woman, they've lost a lot of weight. They probably don't have much of an appetite, don't feel like eating, it's a tea and toast diet. Have tea and biscuits or tea and toast every friggin' meal. Um, so it's about making use of dense things like chocolate or ice cream. Um, and then, yeah, going out for food. Uh, because often, as we know, the portion sizes are usually bigger. Uh, and then we just tell them to go the other way as what we do for weight loss. So instead of starting with veggies, don't ask for veggies just have chips and your beef or chips and your steak. Um, sometimes in the hospital when I was seeing people with malnutrition, I'd just tell them to serve them up the, yeah, no, no veg. So they just have the protein portion and then have the dessert um, just because you want to make use of every little ounce of room in that stomach. Uh, and then fluid is the other thing. So. So doesn't all that, I mean, that's all pretty stock standard yeah. nutrition advice. Yeah, easy. So in relation to protection around dietitians should be the referral point for malnourished people. Do you think that's an easy thing we just put everybody, I mean, anyone, like I would tell my name whether I was a dietitian or not to just go and eat biscuits and, you know, cake. Yeah, but a lot of the time when, well, especially with the older generation, you see a lot in the hospital when they're malnourished because I haven't seen that many in private practice. But they'd always think that to get better, they have to eat more veggies. So they'd just be pumping veggies. And then it's because there's so much nutrition misinformation and there's so much media going, you know, Macca's is bad for you and all of that, that it's missed. Like we think it's simple, but it's not simple for them. And they're like, oh no, they're having their veggies. You know, they're, they're trying really hard, just like, Stop eating your veggies. <laughs> the number of times I've said that to people. You? Yeah. Have you? Yeah. 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 <clears throat> yeah, I'm used to, you know, working aged care. Yeah, so it's just like, yeah, I don't, yeah, leave that aside <laughs> for the moment. Pump up, have two serves of ice cream. Just have ice cream for dinner if you can only eat that. Um, but again, with malnutrition, then it's about what they enjoy. 
making use of the time that they're actually hungry and if they enjoy the food, they're likely to eat more of it. So if it's mashed potato that they love, bam, pile it up with butter and cream and just smash it's really it. really delicious, And cheese. <laughs> yeah. Cheese, cream, butter, smash it. Um, adding cheese to all the veggies if they're adamant about having cheese, so butter and cheese on, um, adamant of having veggies, have butter and cheese on like all the veggies. Like a cut off a knob and put it on there. Yeah, mm. I don't know. And then in terms of us protecting, it's we can't protect anything. Everyone thinks they know how to help people lose weight, mm. so they're going to have to think that they can help people gain weight or muscle or whatever else. That's the industry we're in. Everyone who eats has an opinion. So that's another topic of a rabbit hole that we can go down every single day of our lives as a dietitian. But, <laughs> um, for the moment, that's, yeah, I guess how we would do it. And yeah, you don't need to use the PDSGA, SGA, MNT, whatever you want to use when you need that additional weight, especially for reporting, or you need that clinical justification in yourself to know that you're right. Eventually you'll do enough that you know you're right. Um, you have that confidence, but especially for the first year or two, you might just need that backup just to make sure you've ticked off those boxes for yourself. Kill. Cool. Mm -hmm. Good. Done. Is that it? Yep. Over and out. Subscribe, please, now. Do it. Click it. There's a little bell there too. Click that so you get notified every time there's a new um, video that's on YouTube. So do Winner. that now. Like you're not doing it. Do it. <laughs> <laughs>